Welcome, everyone, to SI Media with Jimmy Trainer. Thank you for listening. We have a great, great episode for you this week. Mike Breen, the lead NBA voice for ESPN, about to call his 18th NBA Finals, is our guest. And following Mike Breen, we have Sal Akata with our Train of Thoughts segment. Before we get to the episode, let me just tell you quickly, if you've missed any recent SI Media with Jimmy Traina podcast episodes, you should check them out in the archives and subscribe to the podcast. Ian Arapaport from the NFL Network was on last week, got a lot of great feedback on Ian. He was great. Rich Eisen two weeks ago, Jim Miller three weeks ago, Jim Nance four weeks ago, all recent guests right here on SI Media with Jimmy Traina. So subscribe to the pod, check out those interviews if you missed any of those, and leave a review on Apple. We read Apple reviews that we got for the month of April in the Train of Thought segment with Sal Akata today on this episode. So stay tuned for that. All right, Mike Breen on the NBA and his legendary career, followed by Train of Thoughts with Sal Akata, right here, right now on SI Media with Jimmy Trainer. All right, joining me now, the voice of the NBA, lead NBA play-by-play guy for ESPN and ABC. You'll be hearing... A lot of him now in the next coming weeks. Mike Breen. Mike, how are you? Jimmy, I'm good. Um, and right away, I'm going to disagree with you. <laughs> I, I hate the term the voice of the NBA. I, well, I hate you call the finals, so you're the voice of the NBA. That's how it works. No, it, 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 <laughs> not really, because if you if you look at it, you know, say, um, say Boston gets in the finals. Their radio boy, Sean Grandy, who is fantastic, he's the voice of the NBA for the Celtic fans. Mike right. Gorman, you know. So every team has their own voice of the NBA. Then you have all of our terrific play-by-play people at ESPN, all the terrific people, play-by-play guys at, at TNT. Um, so there's a lot of voices for the NBA. I, I, ne- I, I know it sounds trivial, but I'm never comfortable with that because there are so many uh, great voices in the NBA, and that's who the fans sometimes think is their voice of the NBA. All right, well, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable right off the top, but I guarantee you everybody listening to this considers you the voice of the NBA. So just, you know, we'll... we'll, we'll just shut uh, up is what you tell me. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we got it. We, no, listen, listen. I mean, it's hard for me just because of my age, where I grew up, how I grew up. It's hard for me to think of anyone other than Marv as the voice of the NBA, but the, I feel like the mantle has been passed. Marv is in retirement, and you pick up the mantle now. Well, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like you. To me, the yeah. voice of... Be able to always be more about yeah um and i mean listen this is going to be your 18th nba finals i mean that makes you the voice of the nba i mean eight, that's a pretty that's a pretty good run it's a pretty it, good it, run it's impossible to to fathom I, I certainly never thought anything like that and the honor to do it all these years is still some years it's hard to me, for me to believe I, every year game one before game one of the finals um, I'm just thanking a lot of people and can't believe that I'm in the position to, to do it. And and this year, and co- correct me if I'm wrong, is it, this is my opinion. I'd love your take because obviously you know this way more. Than, I feel like I don't ever remember a season going into the postseason and how the postseason has played out up until this point where we're sort of about to get to the conference finals soon where it's just been as wide open as it is. I don't ever remember it this wide open. Where anybody, uh, if you said any team won the NBA Finals, you wouldn't be shocked. Right. I, I've called it all along, even during the regular season. It's the season of the unpredictable. I have never seen a season with so much unpredictable outcomes, performances by teams, performances by players. Uh, it's like none I've, I've ever seen. And to me, that adds to the excitement. It's always great to have that Goliath Um but when you have where so many teams feel that they can win it, it, it just it adds to the drama. It adds to the theater. And uh, that's why I felt the regular season and now the postseason has been great. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, vote, I, I, I sort of feel like in every league, NFL, baseball, NBA, I, I see the pluses when you have a dominant team. And I see the pluses when you have sort of a, a villain, a team that people want to root against. You know, the Patriots and the NFL, you know, come to mind a little bit. But I've enjoyed it so much, the, the postseason of the NBA this year, 
with everything, you know, one night you think, okay, this is, you know, the Lakers might be the best team in the West. But one night you think, okay, you know, there was a, you know, in the first round, I thought the Kings would maybe make a run because they look so good in that first round. The East was always wide open, but you have that shocker with Milwaukee out. I think it's, I think this postseason, is, I, the ratings have been great for TNT and ESPN, but I think this has been one of the more exciting postseasons I can remember in, in recent times. Well, we, we could have two play-in teams going at it in the finals. And that says it right there. Um, yeah. You mentioned Milwaukee. Most people had Milwaukee a definite in the finals. And they don't just lose in the first round. They lose in five games to a team that lost a play-in game. Yeah. It's just, it's wild. And, and I think part of it is, and I can't remember this happening. You know, every year we say a team, certain teams, or oh, they have a small margin for error. Well, even the elite teams this year have a small margin for error. Even the elite teams have flaws. And that's why you see the unbelievable fluctuation in, in performances from game to game. I mean, playoff series always have that. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's the annual tradition of overreacting to one playoff win and one playoff loss. But with that said, it's still even the great teams or the teams you consider the elite teams are so unpredictable because they, they have their flaws as well. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the only negative I, I, I can come up with from this postseason, I really only can come up with one, and it sort of ties into the regular season. I feel like one of the biggest themes throughout the regular season has become the controversy surrounding load management. And we get to the postseason, and we're, we've seen so many big players get injured. You know, Giannis missed some games. Jimmy Butler missed the game. He, Tyler Hero. Um it, you know, it's interesting that load management is such a thing. And then in the, it's, I think the bottom line is you just can't control injuries. They're going to happen whether you have load management or not, as, we're, as we've seen in the postseason. Well, playoff success, number one, talent. And number two, and it's right behind, is health. Yeah. Always is, always will be. And, and you know, some players who, who had load management during the course of the regular season, they're still getting hurt. Right. Um, and, and now you're seeing, too, you're seeing some players who are not used to playing major minutes, playing 40 plus minutes, 44, 45 minutes. And you look at them at the end of the game and they're gassed, absolutely gassed. So I, I get it. Um, but for me, the load management, that whole controversy is more uh, a problem for the fans. Yeah. For the fans that pay all the money for the tickets, maybe the one game they go to because they want to see one player. Their child is just want to see one player. And that one player is not playing in the one game they go to. And, and that's, to me, that's the hard thing about it. I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you to criticize an ESPN colleague, but what did you make of Mike Greenberg saying the Lakers should rest all their starters in game six? Well, there's some people that agree with that. I, I don't. Yeah. Uh, and there's no way you're going to rest LeBron James for a playoff game. He's never missed a playoff game. Now, he's missed a lot of regular season games. He's never missed a playoff game. And he is not going to miss a clinch playoff game. Um, there's just no way he's going to do it, especially against the Golden State Warriors. And you come playoff time, you, you can't play with fire like that. You can't overthink it. He needs to be on the court. So, you know, it's funny. I, I don't really ever write out specific questions. I just have, like, topics and bullet points. And I just have one bullet point that says LeBron – and I wanted to get into LeBron a little bit with you because what he's doing at 38 years old is obviously ridiculous. And I, I sort of feel like we, we take it for, we've taken him for granted a little bit at what he's doing at his age. And the fact that you would just mention that he's never missed a postseason game. I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even know that. I didn't realize that. I mean, we, you know, it, we say it so casually. I mean, think about that. This is a guy 38 years old. How many years in his career has he missed the playoffs? Once or twice, probably. Oh, well, maybe a couple of years there at the beginning with Cleveland. But a couple of years with, with yeah, yeah. But for him to never miss a playoff game, I mean, that's just unbelievable. He is. Uh, you're right. All the great players, whether you're talking about Kobe, LeBron, Steph Curry, Tim Duncan, I always felt um, they're always taken for granted because you just expect them to play at this level of greatness night in and night out. And they, they basically do what he's doing though, at this age, um, he's putting up numbers that even all-star players would give anything to play up when they're 24. The numbers he put up this season in his 20th year at age 38, there are many players in the hall of fame. If you take their best season, it doesn't equal to what he did. Um, he's just, 
He's, he has, I've always said this, he has the longest prime in the history of the NBA and uh, he could be the most remarkable. And you know, I don't get into the GOAT debates. That, that stuff drives me crazy. But I've always said with him, he, he takes a backseat to no one who's ever played the game. You know, I, I wish I remembered who it was because I don't remember. I, I think it was maybe Reggie Miller calling the game with Harlan, but I don't know. It might have been York. I don't remember the crew, but it was in the first round of the playoffs, one of the games, and LeBron, I think, grabbed a rebound, ran down the court at full speed and, and put in a layup. And whoever the analyst was, I think it was Reggie Miller, just, all, all, the, all he said was, he's 38 years old. <laughs> and he, the the power that he still has the speed it, it's it's really remarkable but it's what i think the fans know but you really have to understand it's all sacrifice the reason he's been able to play like this he spends so much time getting his body ready letting his body recover knowing everything that needs to go in for for him to be able to do that to do a coast to coast play like that so he sacrifices his time his personal time his time with his family all the great ones do that. Kobe Bryant did it. Steph Curry does it. But for LeBron James at this level, so much goes into getting his body ready and getting his body the, with the ability to do that. Um, that's the whole key to that. And how many players are willing to do that? Now, in the end run, the sacrifice, of course, it's worth it for him. Um, but he, he sacrifices a lot to get to play at this level year after year, night after night. Funny, funny LeBron story that, ties into you i know you you're not on twitter we've talked about this before and you try not to pay attention to all that stuff which is smart um but i was going through twitter just to see if anything was going on with you and what fans were saying and obviously we all know about bang and way off have become these things that the fans love that you do but in the in the last laker warriors game that you called lebron had a a block and you had said i think your call was you know blocked by lebron or or it was your call was similar to when he had probably the greatest block in nba history in the finals and all these warriors fans on twitter <laughs> were saying that mike breen was giving them ptsd with the way you called the lebron block against the lakers the other night because it was the same way when he was with cleveland when he had that still hard to believe block against the warriors in the finals well, the, uh, for me, always, um, I, I, in some ways, I find the block shot the most exciting play in basketball. Um, because not only is it, a, is it a great play for for your team, it's such a deflating play for the opponent. And, you know, that block basically won won the finals and won his championship uh, because right. of what he And the block he did the other day from where he started to then, it was it was equally as exciting. The stakes obviously weren't as high. Right. Um, it, it was magnificent. And he, he just continues to, to do the magnificent as if it's routine. And by the way, I have a Twitter account because the best way to follow the NBA is on Twitter. I follow writers, teams, everything. And it's, it's the best way. I just don't tweet. So you're an Iron Eagle. That's the Iron Eagle move. Yes, I don't know we, if, who, who did it first. You were Iron. Iron and I have discussed this. Not only is it, is it the best way, it's also very good for our mental health. Yeah. I, Ian will text me something that like I tweeted or and I'm like, oh, you sneaky devil, you. You're not, you, everyone thinks you're not on there and you're on there. So. It's, it's almost impossible to follow the league properly. It's almost impossible not to be on. Yeah. Um, do you ever, though, see stuff about yourself while you're secretly on there? Yeah, I, I get, I have, a, I have a, a group of friends too that, that like to find negative stuff to, to send to me. And that's the kind of friends you want. The kind yeah. of friends you humble. And let you know you're not so you're not so hot, pal. Uh, and they love but to say. I would say, out of all of the lead play by play men across sports, I'm just thinking of you know Buck and Nancy. I, you you get it the least on social media. I, I could tell you that. Well, Someone who's know, people have been very kind. So yeah. Yeah. no complaints. Hey, it, it's such a, a subjective thing. Me as a, you know, when I watch games, there there are certain announcers I just love love. And, and hoping they're doing the game because I, I think they had to it. And then there are others you don't like as much. Yeah. And I'm sure there are many uh, uh, fans out there who can't stand when all of a sudden I come on their screen. They'd rather have so many others do the game. And that's all part of it. And that's the beauty yeah. of fans. Like, yeah, but you, you get it the least, I think, out of anyone. So that, that that's a good sign. I, you know, I meant to ask you, everyone knows you do the games, obviously, with Jeff Vango, the Mark Jackson. 
and I know during the year, sometimes you'll do a game just with Jeff or just with Mark. This year, did you work? With, do you ever work with analysts outside of those two for, when you do an ESPN game? Yeah, I, I, I get, uh, I always request uh, a few games with Yubi. That's what I, okay. That's, you know, it's something I treasure. Um, yeah. Friendship with him and learning from him all these years is, is, is truly one of the, the joys of my life. So I get with him. Uh, I get a bunch of games with Doris as well. I love working with Doris. Yeah. And I've even gotten a couple of games with J.J. Reddick and Richard Jefferson this year. And it's really fun that, you know, they're different analysts, um, different broadcasts, different ways, like for me to prepare with some as opposed to others. So it all makes it interesting. And it's, it's, it's great to kind of to sample around. I, I wrote this, I think, maybe at the start of the playoffs, but I do feel like NBA fans are very lucky because I think across the board, the the play by play people, especially you, Ian Harlan, Mark Jones, uh, Ryan Rucco. I, I know I'm leaving out a couple others, um, are all outstanding. And the analysts you just mentioned, um, uh, Jeff, I think is the best. Obvious, yeah, and and. I am a big fan of Reddick and Richard Jefferson, sort of the new wave. Doris is great. The talent in, in NBA broadcasting, I think more than any other sport, is really, really strong. Well, I'll say from the play-by-play standpoint, um, I, I can't remember this many terrific play-by-play. Now, now, again, I'm talking as a fan, Jimmy. Yeah. I'm watching, and my, one of my favorite things in the playoffs is to watch the games on the nights I'm not doing a game. So last night I'm watching, and, and you have so many terrific play-by-play voices. You know, you just look at ESPN with uh, Dave Pash, who's one of the most underrated play-by-play guys in the business. Mark Jones, Ryan Rucco. Uh, and then you go to TNT, the ones you mentioned, Brian Anderson, Spiro Didis. I mean, in addition to, of course, Ian and Kevin, who are two of the all-time great. Um, there's just so many really good play-by-play voices. And, you know, still even after all these years, I listen to see how they handle situations. And I yeah. still – You'll learn from how, you know, they, they use certain situations and how they, when they bring their partners in, when they don't, how they handle the, uh, the referee, mic, all the different stuff. Uh, I'm still learning from watching so many great play-by-play voices. It is, um, it's interesting that that sport, I think it's, it's so deep. Um, and when you, so when you work with a different analyst outside of Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson, do you have to change anything you do and, also, tell me the difference when you're doing three people in the booth as opposed to two. Well, I'll take the first question first. For example, yeah. if I do a game with Jeff and Mark, I'll get more stats, team ranks, player ranks, team stats, recent trends, because those guys, they do so much of their, it's the eye test, what they're seeing right in front of them. When I do a game with Yubi, I, I'll prepare very few stats because he loves the numbers and loves to use the numbers. So if I'm using a lot of numbers when I'm doing a game with Yubi, it's just too many numbers. But with Jeff and Mark, I can do more with numbers because it's not just, you're just not throwing over, throwing numbers at, uh, at the viewer at home, which can get crazy sometimes. So that's like an adjustment there. Um, as for with Mark and Jeff, um, it's, you know, we've been doing it so long, it, it's so easy. You just have to know going in that I'm gonna talk less. And I'm okay with that because those two, uh, they have one of the special um, chemistry partnerships, whatever word you want to use, in the history of sportscasting. Um, I, I'm amazed on, on how good they are in terms of, you know, I, I think, Jimmy, for, the, for that to work, number one, you have to respect the other analysts. And Mark and Jeff have the utmost respect as players, as coaches. Number two, you really do have to like each other. And, you know, that's what makes it special with them, that they, they have, you know, such an affection for each other, such respect for each other, that they can talk about and go at each other on anything. And there is zero fight for airtime, zero. Often, like when we're going to break, and our producer, Tim Corrigan, is saying, go to break, Jeff, you take this one, or Mark, you take this one. He does that a lot. Sometimes, Jeff will just go, just point to Mark, you go. Or Mark will do the same thing. There is no ego. They just... Um, they just want to share each other's comments and, and make it good for the viewer. You hit on something there about, I think also if you're going to go three man booth, the two analysts have to be able to disagree and argue on the air, which I think some people may be not comfortable doing 
obviously they've worked together so long they can do it. I mean, I, I wish I remember there was this, there was something happened maybe last week or two weeks ago. Might have been a, a, a call on a I don't know if it was a technical or a push or something, and and Van Gundy said it wasn't, and Mark said it was, and they went back, they went back and forth, back and forth, six, seven, eight times, and then you know they they move on. But I think you have to do that to sort of be authentic for the viewers. Well, absolutely, and that's where the the relationship um, is key to that. So my first year calling games was Nick's radio. Jeff was an assistant coach. Mark was a player. So we've all known each other for 30 years. And for basically more than half of that, we've been a, a team on the air. And, and I think it's the most underrated part of the business uh, in terms of developing that. Now, sometimes you have a first time analyst working with for the first time and you just instantly hit it off. But to get to that point, that comfort level where you can talk about anything, you can disagree about anything, uh, it just makes it so enjoyable. And that's why like for me, when I work with them, and I have to take a back seat, um, let them go. It's to me, it's entertaining, it's informative, it's fun, it's different. And also a beauty of them when it comes to a close game down the final two, three minutes, they just back off. And and I never have to tell them, you know, lay out and stuff. They they just get it, they understand right. it. Respect for the game knows that certain times you have fun, and certain times you concentrate on basketball, and certain times you let me make a call at the end. Yeah. Give me, give me something from this season or this playoffs or, or regular season um, where you were doing your thing and Jeff said something where you said, what the hell did he just say? Well, just last weekend, they crushed me, <laughs> crushed me because the Lakers uh, were winning big. And I mentioned, boy, Golden State, they don't want to lose big, but if they kept it closer, at least LeBron James and Anthony Davis would have to play more minutes. Now they're getting rest for the next game. <laughs> for the next three minutes, I got destroyed. Just destroyed. <laughs> and this is one time I fought back. Sometimes I acquiesce. Listen, those two guys <laughs> more about the game than anything. But I'm like, I'm in like a, a fetal position, <laughs> just pounding away. Uh, and when What's a valid point. What, what was their argument against your point? They think completely overrated. I mean, oh, okay. they, load manager drives them crazy. And they're thinking, oh, what's the difference between 35 minutes and 41 minutes? It means nothing. And I kept, but he's 38. And I, the more I, the more I argued my case, the more the the, uh, the the punches kept throwing at me. There were a couple. Somebody sent me a couple of, of memes on uh, on Twitter of two guys just wailing away, punching <laughs> Mark and Jeff what they were doing to Mike. That's funny. You know when um when we when it became clear that it was going to be Knicks versus Heat in this round, I fired up the YouTube to, I wanted to watch the, the famous fight from many, many years ago when the Knicks were actually relevant until now. And uh, I was saying, I wonder if, I was, I said, I was trying to think of where you were, if you were doing the game locally, nationally, radio, because it was so long ago. And I, fa I I watched the clip. It was a, a TNT game. Vern Lundquist had the play-by-play. -play. And the Jeff Van Gundy performance in that fight with Alonzo Mourning was even crazier than I remembered. I mean, we all know he was on the ground holding the leg. But then when he gets up, he's all disheveled. I mean, it's such a great clip. And you know, the fond memories of that era and Riley going from the Knicks to the Heat and the Riley. I mean, where where were you for that fight? Uh, we were calling the game for that. Okay. And um, I, I just, you know, it was a different era. It was hand-to-hand yeah. -hand from the <laughs> open tip. Most of the games, or not most, but a good portion of them, neither team reached 80 points. I right. mean, it would, you look at the scores back then. It's like, are you kidding me? Um, and you know, Jeff was, he was the underdog coach who, you know, had to prove himself to these players and they loved them and respected him. And he would fight anything for him. He showed it there. And that, that moment, uh, in terms of his place amongst Nick fans and, and people they worship, that solidified it because it showed he would do anything uh, to fight for his team. And that's why, you know, he had nights where they were chanting 19,000 plus Madison Square Garden, Jeff Van Gundy, because yeah. of that. Um, yeah. he gets, he's really good and patient when people bring that up, but I'm sure he's tired of hearing about it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, but 
I, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it until, you know, it, it, when we saw Nick's heat, I said, oh, I got to, I just, I'm just curious about what happened because it was so long ago. I, I would assume for you, would it, am I correct in guessing the thing you would probably get sick of being asked about is Malice in the Palace? Um, no, I, I, I don't, I don't get sick about it because I don't get it too much. Um, oh, okay. Every time the anniversary comes around. But I mean, it's it's one of the, the signature moments of that era, yeah. uh, and to be there and and I just I remember so many people part of the broadcast who were unbelievable. The cameramen, what they did in, in that moment, in the middle of all these fights, putting themselves in harm way, it was incredible. It was one of the great performances by a camera crew I've ever seen. And um, you know, we were really. Pr- I mean, I remember in Detroit we went back to the hotel afterwards. And nobody could sleep. We we got a late dinner. We must have stayed up to three, four in the morning. It was Bill Walton, myself, Jim Gray, who was magnificent that night. Um, and we just we couldn't believe what we just saw. We talked about it until, until the wee hours of the morning, and the crew as well. It was just um, it just was one of those special nights. Special, you know, obviously it was yeah. a, a terrific night for the NBA. Right. But for us to cover something of that magnitude, uh, everybody felt good about about the way it ended. <clears throat> and as as you know as well as anybody. You know, like I, I love basketball since I was a kid, and I loved it because it's a team sport. There's something about the team sport aspect of it. Well, broadcasting basketball is the same thing, man. It's a it's a team sport, and for it to work, everybody's got to be on the same page. Producer, director, graphics, tape edit, um, the camera crew. Camera people are the unsung hero of uh, a professional uh, sports live on the air. So it's it's really neat when it all comes together and you walk away feeling, you know what? As a team, we just nailed that one. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you don't want to be part of this, but I do think that there's so much added to the legend of the Malice in the Palace that it was you and Bill Walton calling that game, too, instead of just like, you know, two other people. It, it, I, and the documentary that Netflix did was so good on it, by the way. Um, it really shows you how it built, 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 and then it got to that that point where all hell broke loose. It was, it was really well done. And for yeah. Bill... I- Bill loves the game as much as anybody I've ever met. And he was genuinely like, it was painful for him to watch his sport that he loved have a night like that. And that yeah. was, you know, that, that really came across on the air, how, how he was really hurting that night. Yeah. We talked, we talked a little bit about load management. We're talking here about fights and how the game has changed. I'm just curious as, I mean, you're as part of the NBA as anyone, if, and the NBA is on a roll right now. I think, you know, like I said, the ratings have been great for the postseason. A lot of momentum. New TV contracts going to come. They'll make a lot of money. But if you were Adam, if I if I gave you Adam Silver's job for a few minutes, and you can change or fix one or two things in the world of the NBA, and I made you commissioner for you know a day, what would you what would you like to see implemented or fixed or changed? Wow, um, there's a lot of Little things, I, I think, as a yeah. whole, great place. Um, the talent level is is off the charts. Um, but what I miss, and maybe this, I'm showing my age. Well, I'm, I miss post play. Uh, I thought that was such a great part. It, it's part of the the whole ballet of of the NBA, um, and there's really very little of that. And now you get, and the, it's just nonstop three pointers. And today's player, the range and their their ability to do it is just off the charts. But I think it's a little it's a little too much. They're, you know, it's fun to watch a team come down back from twenty by nailing three after three. That's exciting. There is nothing worse than watching you know one team shoot five of twenty nine from three and the other six from thirty three. It's just that's a hard watch. Yeah. And I find that if they if they maybe even put the three point line out a little bit or at least took out the three point line in the corner, which is only 22 feet. You know, it's a foot, nine inches shorter than the top of the key. And that's a big difference. Anybody who's ever taken a jump shot, that extra couple of feet is a big difference. So maybe tweak that a little bit to make, make the three pointer more special. But at the same time, it's one of the reasons why, you know, some of the games down the stretch uh, are so exciting. The the phrase this year is 20 point lead, the, the NBA where 20 point leads go to die. Uh, because that three pointer has has that ability to to yeah. keep putting in the game. It's a good one. I you know I, it, the game has definitely changed. Obviously, um, 
I, I, I would, I, I, that could be interesting pushing the three point line back a little bit, maybe. Or just so, cut out the ones. The Have the line one, yeah. a little bit more where that 22, because that's so easy for these guys, right? Yeah, now. yeah. They would never in a million years do this, but I'd love to see them cut out a couple of the timeouts, maybe go to like three timeouts. The end well, of those games sometimes are just. Years ago, and it had, it had an impact mainly at the end of the game. Remember this about five years ago, it seemed like every, the last two minutes of every game took 20 minutes. Yeah. Cut down a timeouts in the final three minutes. Uh, they cut back on the challenges on every single out of bounds. That's no longer uh, part of it. Right. And I think that's really helped the end of games because um, that's where the game's so exciting. And you don't want that momentum of the end of a close game to be stopped by constant replays, constant challenges, constant timeouts. And I think they've addressed that. Could it be a little better? Perhaps, but they yeah. did address it. Yeah. There's a, there was a lot of controversy this year surrounding the MVP. Do you think the MVP, the vote should come maybe after the postseason and have the postseason factor into it? Or do you like that it's just a regular season award? Yeah, no, it has to, it has to be the regular season award. If you want to have an MVP total of the playoffs – in addition to the finals, I think we're getting a little crazy then. <clears throat> but no, it's a regular season award, and that's what it should be because it's unfair. It could be a, somebody that had just a spectacular season, one of the great seasons in the history of the game, and his team finishes one game back of the final playoff spot because you know their star center missed fifty games. Um, that's what's you know that would penalize somebody who had had a, a season deserving of an MVP. So I I kind of like the way it is. You know, we're going to have debates, and I guess that's fun. Um, what drives me crazy is when, you know, you had this year, you had Jokic, Embiid, and Atetokounmpo, all three deserving of MVP, all three. Yet there are some people saying, oh, there's no question. It's Jokic. There's no way the other two. No, it's, that's, that's not the case. Um, you know, they're, they're, in sports, there's very few things that are black and white. There's gray area in everything. And with that vote, I mean, how could you not watch the three of them and not think all three deserved it? And ha not have a problem if the other one got it over and over. And, and that that's, gets a little crazy because there were so many great performances this year. You just had to pick one. Yeah. I want to get into some things about you and your career before we wrap here as we did the overall NBA stuff. Um, you know, it's funny. When we were trying to set this up, everything was sort of in flux because you didn't know what games you were calling next, what days, you know. Do you like... Not knowing where, you know, I know, I guess there's a little difference here between TNT and ESPN because before the, this round, TNT announced that these crews are calling these series, whereas you guys at ESPN bounce around. Uh, does it bother you to not know where you're going next? Or you just, you want to do the best game that's being played that night? Or would you like a little more of a heads up? How, how would you feel about how the schedule's done for you? No, I, I, I love it because often it leads to, we can see a lot of different teams. Now, this year's a little different. With the Lakers and the Warriors in, we kind of go towards where, where they're playing, whether it's yeah. against each other or in the first round. Um, and I love to do, you know, obviously the big games, but I love to see the other teams too. So when you get to the conference final, you've seen everybody. When you get to the finals, you've seen anybody. It's a little easier for me because during the regular season with all the Nick games, I see every team and I'll see them usually uh, multiple times. Uh, but I like to bounce around uh, in the East and the West. Um, sometimes it's hard getting flights when you know when you know last minute. Uh, but other than that, no, it's it's great, and I love to see the different arenas. Um, you know, because every year is is, yeah. is different. For example, you know, the year that nobody expects the team to be really good. There's no better arena to be in than a team that is overachieved or a team that is is uh, achieving success uh, for the first time in years. Yeah. Those are the best arenas to go in. Not the arenas that are spoiled by teams that are in the finals every year. Right. Not the Golden State spoiled, right. but uh, you look at at some of these other teams like Sacramento. Sacramento is insane, unbelievable. Insane. Yeah. That I couldn't wait to go and do a game there because because you knew it was it meant so much to those fans. And even yeah. Madison Square Garden this year um, in that first round against Cleveland, it it was the building the roof was going to blow off because you know it's been a dry spell for them and for them to have a team that was fun to watch and and successful the fans just they enjoyed every second yeah so we're taping this on wednesday the heat have a 3-1 lead on the knicks right now and the lakers have the 3-1 lead on the warriors when we're taping this do you know what your next game is 
Uh, all depends on what happens on these games tonight. That's that's wild. Um, the I'm Knicks, actually, you actually going because TNT's doing the game. I'm going to. The, I'm going to sit in the stands with my kids, um, two of my children, who I never get to sit in the stands and watch a Nick game with. Oh, that's um, great! So you're going tonight. Yeah, oh. so I'm going to go tonight and sit with them, and I, I can't wait because, uh, like I said, over all these years, most of the time I'm doing the games. Every once in a while, there's a TNT game I can go with them. But to go to a playoff game with them uh, as a dad, I, I can't wait. See, TNT should show you as one of the celebrities, but they probably won't do it because you're the competition. But it should be, you know, Spike Lee and whoever. They, go, and then it should be Mike Breen. But the competition, they won't they won't allow that probably. Uh, the, the, the amount of celebrities that have, that have been at the Garden, it's yeah. like, you know, usually they do one at a time during a timeout. Well, they have they've, they've been so many that have asked for tickets and have gone in the fourth quarter now. They have a montage. Yeah. Quick shot, 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 one after another. I've never, in all the years, I've never seen that. Yeah. So these high celebrities that usually get top billing, they're in the back of the montage for crying out loud. That's wild. Um, speaking, you know, you just reminded me of something here. Um, when you said you're going to go to the game and sit in the stands with your kids. When I, when I had you on this podcast the last time a couple of years ago, after the pod came out, my cousin called me and said, and told me a story that he had told me before and I had forgotten. What's your cousin's name? His name is AJ. Cousin AJ, okay. And he said that he was at a Nick game one time, and I guess he wasn't in great seats, and you were there, and you pulled him down and put him and his buddy in good seats. Is that something you do regularly, or have you done it throughout the years many times? Well, I, That's I used- phenomenal. I had I have two tickets uh, to every game, and every once in a while you couldn't get somebody would cancel last minute, and rather than just see him go to waste, um, I would before the game I'd go to the highest level because you know the fans up there are the ones that you know they'll right. they want to be there more than anybody, and I try I used to try and find a parent and a child, and would give them tickets and say hey you know. Once you use these down there, they're a little better. I'm not using them tonight. And often they look at me like, no, nah, I think I'll stay here. They're thinking some kind of scam. Right, right, right. I convince them sometimes I'd walk them down to show them how to get down there if I had time. Uh, but it was a, it was a cool thing because I remember being that kid. Yeah. Being up and thinking, man, if I could just sit down there, how cool would that be? Um, and I, I didn't do it a, a ton, but I, every once in a while I did it. You know what the sad thing is now? You can't really do it now because there's no tickets in hand. Oh, With right. The, it's on the phone, right? And I suppose you can, but there's comes a certain point yeah. where it's hard to do. It was so easy to do when you had the tickets in your hand, yeah. and now it's difficult to do. Yeah. Well, you did it for my cousin, and he had told me after the pod, and I was all pissed off that I didn't know the story before the pod because I would have asked you, and then he said he had told me about it years ago, but I have a terrible memory, so I had to bring it up this time. And the funny I, thing is, Say that again. Hey, hi to cousin AJ. For me. I will do that. Um, diehard Knicks fan. It's funny because I had tweeted out when the Knicks had one of the games against Cleveland. I tweeted out something about, um, you know, just an FYI, Gus Johnson's doing the game on NBA TV because people on Twitter love Gus. And my cousins right away texted me, how do you not watch Mike and Mike Breen and Clyde Drexler? I said, I, I said, if you want to flip over and get a taste of both, relax. You know, the Nick fans, you suggest anyone other than Breen and Clyde. They jumped down my throat. Clyde Drexler, not Clyde Drexler, Clyde Frazier. And I Clyde Frazier. Did I say Clyde Drexler? You were a secret Portland Trailblazer fan? What the hell? I said Clyde Drexler? Oh, my God. That's awful. I meant Clyde Frazier. That's really bad. That I That's bad. I, I Yeah, I should be fired for that one. Clyde Frazier. Walt Clyde did Frazier. I, did that of your own podcast? I don't know. No, I leave it in. I leave in the mistakes. Let people know I'm an idiot. But the funny thing I wanted to mention about the ticket thing was, you know who does what you did is Billy Joel who does a show every month at the garden. So Billy Joel does not sell tickets to the first two rows of any of his concerts. They don't sell the tickets for the first two rows. And then before the show, he has his tour manager or whoever go up to the 400s at MSG and pull down people to fill the two rows who are up in the 400s. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's amazing in concert. And yeah. So I like the fact when he tells the audience, he says something to the effect of, you know, because he throws out, you want me to play this? Or you want me to play that? Yeah, and yeah. It's to every song. And yeah. he goes, I'm 
A is that everybody's here all the time because I haven't written a new song in 25 years. It's yeah. like it's yeah. unbelievable when you think about it, and he's still so popular. Yeah. See, I when I go because I go see him maybe three or four times a year since he does you know the monthly residency. I get pissed off when he does the "Do you want to hear this song?" and that's because when my song loses, I get irate, and I don't want people determining, you know, <laughs> what I'm supposed to hear. Uh, speaking of the Knicks in the Garden, I was, I'm just kidding. Do you ever think of, because you have the ESPN thing, do you do you ever think of giving up the Knicks gig? I mean, you went through it there now with all those terrible years. Now they're good. So I'd imagine you're a little maybe re, rejuvenated with it. But you like still doing the Knicks with the national gig at ESPN? Yes, I, I love it. But, you know, to, to be with a team all year and see how they grow, uh, see how, how they deal with adversity, how they deal with success. It's, it's, and get to know the people. Um, it's, it's really fun. <clears throat> Obviously, especially cause it's, it's a team I grew up rooting for. Plus working with Clyde is, um, to this day, I still can't believe I get to sit next to this man who, you know, there's still that poster up in my room, um, in my house that I grew up in that my mother still lived. My mother's 90 lives in the same house I grew up in. The Clyde, right. poster, I was 10 is still hanging. And now this guy, I've been sitting with him. He's become a lifelong friend. Uh, it's too much fun. And the, the crew at Madison Square Garden, they're all family. Um, it's a special group. And I, it's hard to give it up. Now, I'm getting old and, and a lot of the flights and stuff are, are, uh, are starting to take its toll. But I still enjoy it so much. So for now, I, if they'll have me, I'll still do it. Well, the Nick fans will certainly like hearing that. Um before I let you go, we have not gotten a double bang yet in the playoffs. Are you saving the double bang maybe for the finals? When do, when do, we, when do we get the double bang? Well, the du- there was a double bang in the playoffs in the bubble. Right. And just to me, it sounded so hollow because <laughs> there was no crowd reaction. Yeah. I, I said at the time, I, I read a line that, that um, the fans are the oxygen of professional sports. And it's true. And it came to fruition. It just, it just, something was missing every game. You'd be excited, you make a call, and there was nothing underneath you. Um, and now it's, now that it's back. I never plan it, Jimmy. I promise you, I, I never. I know, I know. Just when it's. Um, Julius it's, Randall got a double bang this year. Yes. Um, and that was at the end of the game. He had no, he was fumbling the ball, dropping yeah. it. There was a terrible loss, and he hits this amazing shot. I mean, I'll let that. I mean, he's a Nick. You do the Nick games. I got it. But the double bang should be safe for like that top notch. You know, that's a Steph Curry, LeBron level thing. The double bang should be. I agree. I agree. <laughs> but it just came out. It, it yeah. just come. I, I try and save it. I don't try and do it very often. I mean. Yeah, no, I know. I, know. I don't know the percentage of games. I don't ever use it. It's a high yeah. percentage. Um, and that's why it's supposed to meant for a big moment. And every once in a while, I let my emotions. Yeah. We, we've talked about this before. I think I may, there was a game where there was a huge shot and you didn't call bang and people on Twitter were like, where was the bang people? And, and I love that also the, I love that fans, when you give a way off and there's sort of that dis- disappointment in your voice with the way off and people react to that. Like th- there'll be tweets like, you know, I got yelled at as a kid every day by my father, but it was never as bad as the way Mike Breen says way off. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's so good. People like, it's like a shot to the heart when it's yeah. against, against yeah. your team. And uh, you know, it's supposed to be this celebration of a great shot, a quick call yeah. needed for to, to cause angst. I, I should have asked you this earlier when we were talking about LeBron. And I, I, I figured I'd, because you guys have, you have the West, right? ESPN this year has the West and TNT has the East. And then obviously you have the final. So if the Lakers here, they have a 3 1 lead, let's say they, you know, close out Golden State, Western Conference final, Lakers, and then we'll see what happens after that. After all these years, I'm just curious, what kind of relationship, if any, do you have with LeBron? He's been always great, um, very approachable. Um, it's changed, though. And not just him, everybody. Once the pandemic started, there was no more one-on-one sit-downs. That's where you really got to know it. And we were fortunate on the network level to get sit-downs with all the top players. And since that, we haven't been able to get back to it. I've been pushing Even forward. still today? Yeah. it's Now, you can get it once in a while, um, but it's not. You know, you know, If you notice on any of them, you don't see those, those um, snippets, those sound bites 
of players sitting and talking to us anymore, whether it's us, whether it's TNT. And it, there's, I, I've been pushing forward to get back to it because I think it's great for, for fans to see what the person's like talking. Um, and so I miss that. But he's always been, um, always been really respectful, always been really approachable and kind. And when you get him talking, you know, he clearly he's got a brilliant basketball mind. It's, yeah. it's something that you learn from when you talk to him. Yeah, because I he he does he is sort of a, an historian and has so much respect for sort of like the entire fabric of the NBA. And you, I, I don't, I, I'm not saying this to make you uncomfortable, but like being the voice of the NBA, I would imagine he has a certain level of respect for you, given that like, you're calling your 18th finals. He's been in so many of them. You've called so many of his games. I would imagine he has some sort of, you know, understanding of your place in it all. I, I don't know his reasoning why he's been so nice, but um, I know I consider it an honor that I've I've called every one of his finals games, and right. for me, that's an honor. Yeah, is is his is his block, or is there? If you had to pick the greatest thing you've seen in an NBA's finals game that you called, what would be your moment there? Um, that's up there because that one play uh, decided a championship. Um, Ray Allen's three pointer. Um, in that game six, if he doesn't hit that, uh, San Antonio wins because there's right. no game. Seven. Obviously, they had to play another game, but that shot, that shot decided the championship. Those two, those two really stick out. Um, it's just, um, you know, it's hard to pick amongst, you know, all the ones that you've been able to have the privilege of calling, mm -hmm. but those two, because it, it really decide, all right, that doesn't, that shot doesn't go down. The other team wins. That block doesn't happen. The other team wins. And that's, you know, that's a pretty impressive moment when it decides who wins and who doesn't. This will be the last question. We talked about some controversies with load management, what you would do if you were a commissioner. I'll give you a controversy that's come up. I've seen it a lot lately, maybe because it's the playoffs, more eyeballs are on the game. There are a lot of people, I don't know if it's the majority, but a decent amount of people, NBA fans, who want the coaches back in suits they don't like the tracksuit look on the sidelines. Where does Mike Breen stand on the coach's attire? Uh, this is something that Mark and Jeff kill me on because I liked it better with suits. But I, I, I think there's uh, – because I've asked the coaches when it first started. I've asked the coaches, and I think – and I can't remember. I wish I could remember which one. Only one said they wanted to go back to suits. One. That's it. They love this now. Mm -hmm. less, less to pack. Less decisions to make, much more comfortable. The coaches are yeah. almost universal in terms of, of wanting that to stay. I'd like to know which coach wants to be in the suit. That's it. That would be good to know. Yeah, you know Riley would be in a suit if he was still coaching. He, he would, um, he'd have a pretty expensive sweatsuit. <laughs> more style to it, perhaps, than his others. Yeah. yeah. But probably want to stay in a suit. I know Riley's Jim not coming out in like the Nike polo. That, like, that's not happening with Riley. No, and Jeff and Mark would they'd want the sweats. Uh, Jeff because I think Jeff went he actually he said in the first playoff game he had on his usual blue suit. He said he was going to try and and wear the same suit every game for the playoffs. But he he didn't go through it. For a while he only had two suits. There were whole years we went we only had two suits. But his wife did a great job. She got new suits, picked out ties and now he's now he's quite stylish. What do you think? What do you think he's up to now? He has like what? Like maybe does he have like ten suits now? Did he did he increase? No, he hasn't yet. Although Mark Mark in the bubble wore the same, and we did we did. Oh my goodness! It was over fifty games. I think it was. Uh, Mark wore the same black suit every single game in the bubble. Yeah, well, the bubble. There were no rules in the bubble. Right. You know. Oh, you're, yeah. You're. All right, well, I appreciate you doing this. I know it's a crazy busy time for you, and uh, we don't even know what next game to promote for you, but you will have the Mike Breen, Jeff Ango, the Mark Jackson Western Conference Finals on ESPN ABC, and then, of course, the NBA Finals on ABC 18th NBA Finals. And uh, enjoy the Nick game tonight. I want to see you in Celebrity Row. You, Spike, Aaron Rodgers. He's been, we'll see Mike Breen right, right in that mix. Always fun, Jimmy. Thanks. I appreciate you. Thank you. Be well. <laughs> All right, joining me now, as he does every week for our Train of Thought segment from WFAN Radio in New York, SNY TV in New York, my buddy Sal Akata. Sal, how are we this week? Good, Jimmy. How are you? I'm okay. Hanging in there. Um, we're going to read some Apple reviews this okay. week. We haven't done that in a while. 
The listeners have disappointed me, though. There haven't been a ton of reviews. Ah. It's, 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 um, it's dis, what's the word I'm looking for? It's discouraging. Oh, okay. The numbers for the pod it. are good, and I get good feedback, but I can't get people to leave review on Apple. People don't want to be bothered with doing that shit. I know I you know. love it, and it's important, but, like, come on. It's important. And I also think more and more people are are consuming the pod not on the Apple platform. A lot of people on Spotify, a lot of people on YouTube. Um, so I should incorporate, like, YouTube reviews as well, but people on YouTube are nasty. So I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the only place I think people are nice are on Instagram. I, re- yeah. I really believe that. The most vicious people are TikTok. Animals really? on TikTok. Oh, my God. Because it's like everyone on there is like 12 to 17. So they're just animals. I, I can't even. I, I can't even. I want to be dead before any of that stuff becomes even more prevalent. Like, I just can't. I can't take it. I want nothing to do with TikTok. I see commercials from the Yankees talking about TikTok. And I'm like, what are, what are we doing here? What's going on? Got to reach the younger audience. We're, I, we're I old. Guess. We're done. We're finished. Yeah. Good. Put me out of my misery. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I've had I, it. Am I, am, I, am I to guess that part of this attitude that, we have, that you have had in the first two minutes here, I checked in with Sal over the weekend. I gave him a call on Friday afternoon. I said, oh, what do you got going on Saturday for the Nick game? And he drops a bomb. Diehard Nick fan. 3.30 Saturday when the game's going on, Sal had to go to a kid's birthday party. You, How did that work are, out for you? You are not even going to believe this. I'm assuming Uh-oh. you didn't see this on Twitter. So I Here, let me, can, can I just stop you right there? Yeah. The amount of people who have said to me lately, like, oh, did you not see that on Twitter? Or you did... I think I miss everything now because of the way that weirdo Elon has everything set up. I feel like people aren't seeing my tweets. I feel like I'm not saying I'm a shadow ban. I don't think it's that. I just think something's going on where I don't know. But I also don't check it that much over the weekend. Was it, so if you tweet it over the weekend, I probably I don't check it like yes. all Saturday night, Sunday night when I finally like get in the chair and have a drink and watch TV, then like I'll check. But like during the day, I really don't check it on Saturday and Sunday. So I, I am. Yeah. Usually I check out on the weekend myself, yeah. but this was an emergency and I'm glad you didn't see anything. Cause now you're going to get to react live to this. So oh, I was boy. building up on the radio all week to, Oh my God, my life sucks. I got to go to this kid's party at my in-laws house. Of course it's game three of the Knicks playoffs. Knicks in Miami three thirty. What am I going to do? I have my brother-in-law on the radio show Friday night to set up what it's going to be like. I let him know, like, look, man, I ain't messing around here. I need the TVs go. Like, I need to be left alone. So, all that so, so just for clarity, so the birthday party was for your brother-in-law's kid. Correct. No, so twins. it's your wife, niece, or nephew, or whatever it is. To oh. My wife's, yeah. So my wife's brother's kids, twins. He's got twins. Okay. They're like three, year, three years old. Okay. So, so that's, okay. Three-year-old twins, niece, in birthday. Jersey. Okay. And Sal lives Nephew. on Long Island, so we got a two-hour ride. Nephews, yeah, yeah. two-hour ride to Jersey. Cross Bronx, sitting in traffic on the GWB. Like, you couldn't draw up a worse scenario for me, okay? So now we get – and he comes on Friday night. He's like, don't worry. I got you covered. We'll even bring a TV outside if we have to. I'm like, all right, now I'm excited. You know, a little barbecue, watch the game. As long as I can watch the game, basically uninterrupted. I know I can't get peace and quiet, but maybe just one of the two. So I get there. Dude, you're not even going to believe this. This this is like shit that I couldn't make up. What time did you there. arrive? What time? We arrived at like 2 o'clock-ish, I want to say. Okay. Game's at 3.30. Two, 2 o'clock. So I get there. Now, he's got this massive house. He's got this big room with a huge TV. And I'm joking around like, hey, here I am. I got my Knicks jersey on. My daughter's in her Knicks jersey. He's like, hey, I got something to tell you. I'm like, wow, what's going on? takes me to the TV. One of the kids took a bat to the fucking TV. Stop. Stop. I swear. There's pictures of it. I tweeted it. I could, I'm like. Stop. So he's like. So I'm looking at it. At first, I don't notice anything. And then he points it out. And I'm noticing the screen is blurred. Like, I thought it was just because he was on YouTube TV or something. You can't see shit. And there's a huge dent and, like, crack in the TV. This is like an 80-inch wait TV. Wait a second. Wait a second. Was it one of his kids? Yes. 
So and I asked when did him, the kid take the bat to the TV? That's what I said. When did this happen? He said a couple weeks ago. I said, why didn't you tell me last oh, night on the radio? I don't want to get you in trouble with your family, but wow, that guy did you dirty. I'm thinking it happened five minutes before you arrived. No. So I said, Joes, I had you on my radio show to discuss this and hash this out. Why didn't you tell me? He said, because I knew you wouldn't have come if I told you. <laughs> oh, my God. True story. Can I don't even know what to that? say. I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless. You just reminded me, though. I just had a flashback to one of the trips me and my buddies did to Vegas. This was a long time ago. And I was always, you know, I don't want to come across as a dick, but my attitude with my friends was always this. You guys plan the trips. Leave me out of, I don't want to be involved in any planning. Just tell me how much money I have to give you and right. tell me where to be and when. And one of the times flying home, we go to the airport to go home and I'm going, well, where's my seat? And they go, there's no seats. I go, what do you mean there's no seats? They go, we're flying Southwest. I go, so what does that mean? I had never flown Southwest. I didn't know anything right. about it in my life. They go, Southwest, there's no assigned seats. I start flipping out in the airport. <laughs> and I go, well, how do you motherfuckers not tell me this? I would have booked my own flight on a separate thing. They go, well, if we told you, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have come on the flight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh my God. That is, I, I mean, I, I don't want to cross a line here, but that is a now. So disgrace. he brings out he, he brings out this smaller TV at my like poking, like all right, Joe's, let's go. He brings out the smaller TV outside, and then we get set up and whatever. It was fine, and then I said that this TV is about to be broken after watching the Knicks shit themselves for the, oh, that, uh, the entire game. I have so many questions, though. If it happened weeks ago, well, how come it's not been fixed or replaced? I mean, I, I can't. How about I, he I had weeks? Really put another TV in that room for you. Oh, he did I you wrong really, on so many levels. I, I, I'm telling you, it's a massive TV, like whatever, in their main room, their main TV in a main room, massive TV. I'm sure it's thousands of dollars to fix. Maybe that's been a little bit of the hesitation or I, I don't know, but. I didn't really care when they're fixing it. If it's not ready now, it's not my like. It's my you problem can, now. I don't care when you, you fix it. You can get day. a fifty-inch TV for like three hundred dollars these days. It's like the only thing yeah. in America where the price has gone down or it's cheap. I know, I know. I could, but honestly, like you couldn't make it up. And I was to be truthful with you, like you know, we always exaggerate these things a little bit. Obviously, there's truth to it. I was more mad that he didn't bring it up on the air because I would have lost well, it on him on the radio. It would have been great content. Yeah. First of all, I. I you know, I'm not exaggerating anything. The The issue that I have there, if that's me in that situation, if I told you you wouldn't have come, that's, that's I, really, that's truth really be told, I, Truth be told, I probably would have gone anyway. Like, I would have been like, well, as long as you could get another TV set up somewhere, like, you know, and it's my wife I'm dealing with. You know, this is not. I guarantee work. you, you know what people on Twitter are going to say if they see this story or hear this story? Why didn't Sal just like bring an iPad and stream it on his iPad? Or why didn't he stream it on his phone? One, that's what people person, are going to say. One person suggested that you had to see some of the replies. People are like, dude, that's wrong. Get the hell out of there. You got to go to a bar, see if there's a neighbor's house or, you know, it was. Oh, well, once, once he tells you, I didn't tell you because I didn't think you'd come. You have every right to leave, in my opinion. <laughs> You're in, you're right. Because he got you there under false pretenses. He told you you'd watch Correct. the game. You put him on the radio. The game's all going to be set up. I cannot, I'm in stunned disbelief that you didn't say the kid hit the TV with the bat five minutes, 10 minutes before you got there. That's the part I can't get over. Because if that happens, you, you it, it's a funny story. This is not funny. This is a, right. a problem. Which is crazy is that normally I would never even bring it up, right? Like, I just, whatever, I'm screwed, let's go there and figure it out. But because it's such a big game, because I made a big deal of it on the radio, and had him on my show, where he basically left out that detail, that significant detail, I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. He hoodwinked you. you. You got yeah. hoodwinked. It was a hoodwinking. Yeah. It was an absolute Fine. hoodwinking. Oh, okay. I mean, guess what? And then, I, I mean, the cherry on top of the Sunday is you basically didn't have to watch a game after the first quarter. Correct. The game was over anyway. Waste of time. I know. We go, wait till you see the picture. I actually was stunned. I was like, "This, I was like, are you fucking with me? This is a joke, no, right?" But I can't get over it. Happened weeks ago. 
or whatever, maybe a week before, but it was not that morning. He because knew this, about it. To me, this begs the question. If my TV broke, I have, I'm at Best Buy within five minutes. Right. I, I, I can't live without the TV. Right. Well, the TV works. You just can't see much of it. Well, that means it doesn't work. <laughs> wow. Hey, this yeah. is, the hoodwinking is just off the charts. Yeah, I know. Wow. And when I tell you, like, he couldn't be nicer on the radio, Sal, we got you, whatever you need. Yeah, because he was hoodwinking you. We know how it's important to you. Like, do you not know that we're on the radio and people are listening to this? Now you're going to be exposed. It's like a heel wrestling move. Yeah. He hoodwinked you. That's all there is to it. Well, guess what? And now I don't have to go back there until what? Next year, at least? I I think I get a pass. I hope the TV's fixed by then. Yeah. What it, so, so then, so how, so you watch, so he brought, you said he brought a TV outside. He had like a smaller TV that we brought outside and set it up. It was, it actually was nice because it was beautiful. And outside. you were able to watch the game and. Yeah. 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 On like a folding chair moved up right next to the TV, you know, whatever it was. How long did it take you to become unsalty from this incident? Uh, believe it or not. I was not that salty. I was more mad that the Knicks were. It was frustrating, don't get me wrong. But it's par for the course. It's just like, it's another reminder of why you shouldn't get fucking married. It's like another re- <laughs> Shelby, edit that out. Shelby, Shelby, you've got to edit that out. Uh, I'm not being responsible. Edit that out. No, edit that. I'm not responsible. Let's move on. All right, let's, let, all right let me ask you this question. We'll stay in, in the sort of domestic here. Domestic territory. I think I know the answer to this, but it's, do you mow your own one? No. I asked because I just saw a quote from Jim Harbaugh, who like, you know, just signed like a $5 billion contract or whatever it is, that he still mows his own lawn and he called it, quote, one of the great feelings I have in life. Like, isn't the reason you make $50 million is so that you don't have to mow your lawn? What am I missing here? Uh, look, I did that when I was 15 or 14 or whatever. I did plenty of years of mowing the lawn. No, thank you. I didn't want to do it then, and I certainly don't want to do it now. I have never once mowed a lawn in my life. Are you kidding me? Nope. Did your parents always just pay for a landscaper? Yeah. Well, there's wow. two things here. My parents always paid for a landscaper. And two, like if let's say I was in middle school or high school, my parents would have, you know how crazy Italian overprotective whack jobs that they, they would have never let me near a mow lawnmower. They, well, lawn they would have thought I would have like chopped off my foot or, you know, drove over my right. foot and cut it off. No, yeah, my dad had me out there. I, I forget what age, but somewhere around 13, 14, whatever. And I hated it. I hated doing it. But the reason I do this podcast and write a column and have a job at SI is so I get a paycheck that allows me to pay someone to mow the lawn. That is one of the last things I will ever do. That is something I, in the summer at 95 degrees, mowing the lawn, I would rather, well, I'd put artificial turf in my backyard before agreed. I'd mow the lawn. Agreed. It's a waste of time. I don't care if it takes 25 minutes, half hour, a waste of time. Yeah, that's not happening. All right, let's read these Apple reviews here. Like I said, not a ton in the month of April, but we'll see. Uh, we're going to do here April reviews. Here we go. First one, top notch. From Jungle Janners. Really like Jimmy and the podcast as a whole. Originally, I was a fan of Deitch's SI podcast that has now become Jimmy's own flavor. I enjoy the segments with Sal towards the end of each episode, even if it is a bit New York centric. I rarely listen when you have wrestling guests. Maybe I'm missing out on content, but wrestling doesn't move my needle. Keep up the good work, Jimmy. See, nice review. Why can't can, can you guys give me more of those? Got a nice it little word like- for Sal and... It seems like that's like the standard, love the podcast, enjoy the bit with Sal, hate wrestling. It seems like that's a standard. I have to say, I was, uh, for everyone who hates the wrestling, I'm just going to say one quick thing. I'm, I'm, I've become an enormous Cody Rhodes fan after having him on this podcast. I really enjoyed the conversation. And, I, and he had a match with Brock Lesnar on a pay-per-view over the weekend, and I was going to Find Vince McMahon and do something bad if he let Brock Lesnar win, but Cody won, so I was happy. All right, here we go. I know it's fake. You don't have to tell me that on Twitter. <laughs> All right, we got Billy Big Mouth Bass. Great listen. I very much enjoy Jimmy's humorous and insightful takes in sports and broadcasting. Sal's appearances are always entertaining. I only wish that they would change. Oh, this is about the ads, so we're going to skip that. Love the show and the wrestling chats. 
<laughs> yeah, I hear that sometimes the ads don't sort of match this podcast, but I can't do anything about that. All right, here we go. Oh, look at this. 80s Villager. Hello, Sap. Not only did Jim Nance play you for a fool in denying ESPN and CBS unprecedented lack of coverage of Phil Mickelson only to get burned when Phil finished second. He then made you seem like a sap as he contradicted himself, giving you 10 dopey reasons they didn't show Phil. I honestly could not possibly care less whether they showed Phil or not because I didn't watch it. So if I was a sap, then I was a sap. Um, PS7497, Jimmy has been doing a great job with this podcast. Even though I'm not a wrestling person, I know how to use the tools on my phone to skip ahead <laughs> to the weekly trade of thought segment with Sal. <laughs> the interviews have been fun in the conversations with Sal. Make me miss living in the Metro NYC area. Keep up the great job booking interesting guests and getting some incredible information from your guests with your questions and interview style. I love it. One review, a little too much New York. Another review, love the New York. Love the wrestling, hate the wrestling. I do like, see this guy here though. I know how to use the tools on my phone to Brilliant. skip ahead. To the, There you go. That's why, I, that's why I don't get the complaints about the wrestling stuff. All right. right. Last one from Frank Vig. I pay for MLB extra innings mainly to watch Yankee games. We are blacked out from Orioles, Phillies, and Nationals games because we live in Delaware. The Yankees played three against the Orioles and three against the Phillies. Last week, there were games on Amazon and Apple. Eight games that we couldn't see because of blackouts and greed. This has nothing to do with the SI Media podcast. There's no review. But I do complain about the streaming all the time. So I guess Frank wants to bond with me over this. I will say where people say like too much wrestling, I do get now every now and again, I get like, give it up on the complaining about streaming. I will never give that up. I feel for Frank. I mean, did you, did you buy uh, the Sunday ticket yet? No, we have till June 6th, I believe. Just make sure be when you do remind me, cause I'm, it's on my to do list, but I haven't done it yet either. Every single ad when i scroll through twitter is for is from is youtube for the sunday ticket yeah I know. but yeah i have it in my calendar uh june 6th to to okay. get the sunday ticket um I, you know listen i don't want to go on another rant about streaming but if if mlb is going to have all these deals okay i mean how about i don't know if you might sunday morning braves and 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 orioles played at eleven thirty in the morning on nbc and peacock so they have deals with Peacock, Apple, TBS, Fox, FS1, ESPN. And you got to stop with the blackouts. It's ridiculous. Like, get rid of the blackouts. But I don't mind the stream. I mean, look, I don't love the streaming, but I don't mind it if it were one other. Like, wh why couldn't it be just Amazon or uh, whatever, Apple or something else in between? It can't be 30 of them. It's ridiculous. I, 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 I hate the what I hate more than anything is that there are one or two nights a week where I have no idea where the Yankees are. That's what I can't stand. Right. Same thing. It happens to me all the time. I flip on 70 on Yes or whatever channel it is. Flip on Yes, they're not there. Flip on Picks 11, not there. All right, well, they're never on Picks night. anymore, yeah. Or whatever, they're done with whatever Picks. The, uh, do they yeah. even have, so they don't have that? They, it's just, it's either. No, those, are, those Picks games went to Amazon Prime. Okay, so it's Yes, Amazon, and Apple. Yeah, then ESPN, Fox, FS1, Peacock. Right, okay. They're all, you know. Because one time I thought I went to Prime and I was like, where the hell is this game? I couldn't find it. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. All right. I mean, that's what shouldn't happen. It just shouldn't happen. As you like to say when you're in traffic, <laughs> it, it should not be happening. <laughs> it should not be happening. All right. I, I got to go check this picture on Twitter of the TV. But yeah. to me, it's irrelevant. It's. You got hoodwinked. That's the moral of this podcast segment right now. Right. My brother-in-law's a bad guy. That's the bottom line. He lied. God. Well, did you? I mean, he lied. He lied. He hoodwinked yeah. you. I don't, I, I'm curious to hear what the listeners have to say about this. Cannot wait. All right, Sal. Hopefully you have right. a better week uh, ahead, and we'll see you next week. All right. Talk to you later. Take it easy. <laughs> All right, my thanks to Mike Breen and Sal Licata. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you did and you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button and leave a review on Apple. We will read it on an upcoming episode, just like we did this week. And if you've missed any recent episodes of SI Media with Jimmy Traina, check them out in the archives. Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network was the guest last week. Rich Eisen was on the podcast two weeks ago. Jim Miller, three weeks ago. Jim Nance, four weeks ago. So go check those out if you missed any of them. 
And again, if you enjoyed Mike Breen and you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button and please leave a review on Apple. All right, that wraps it up for this week. We'll see you next week right here on SI Media with Jimmy Trainer. Stay safe and take care.